Good morning. Good morning. If I can have everybody take their seats. I know everybody's busy talking, but we're going to go ahead and get started. I know we have some more people coming in in the back. We'll get them registered and in. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Terry Kimball, and I'm the President and CEO here at the San Jose Chamber of Commerce. And I'd like to welcome you to this special engagement featuring Arizona State University President Crow, who will be addressing kind of the state of education and where we're at. And we have an exciting program. I can't wait. I, I was taking a look at some of his slides earlier, and I'm very excited about the, the information that he'll be presenting today. This morning's event is made possible through our, our dedicated sponsors that we hear, have here. And our biggest one is um, Chandler Gilbert Community College. And let's give them a big round of applause. <laughs> we also have um, Intel as our presenting sponsor. Our copper sponsor is Air Products and Chemicals. Our bronze sponsor is Wells Fargo. Our turquoise sponsor is Arizona State University. And of course, um, Chandler Gilbert Community College and their team for being here. Please join me in helping me thank those, those sponsors and their contribution to education in this area. <laughs> we also have several elected officials in the room. Um, joining us today is um, from our, our representative, Jennifer Pollack, from the Arizona Legislature. <laughs> Vice Mayor Terry Rowe. <laughs> Council Member Matt Orlando. Council Member Sam Wong, <laughs> Council Member Mark Stewart, and also our board chair for this year, Lori Gallegos with First Credit Union. <laughs> and we also have several of our board members that are in the room. If I could have you all stand for a round of applause, please. <laughs> it is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Greg Peterson with Chandler Gilbert Community College. Good morning and welcome, welcome to Chandler Gilbert Community College. Hope you had a moment to enjoy our campus this morning. Um, we fixed the weather so it was just perfect to be able to walk around. Uh, we um, are so honored to, to have you here on behalf of Chandler Gilbert, on behalf of the Maricopa County Community College District and our Chancellor, uh, Dr. Maria Harper Marinick. Thank you for taking your time to um, engage in conversation about the state of higher education. Uh, we are. Uh, excited about the role of, um, of ASU in this work um, and our partnership with ASU as a community college system. Um, we at the community college, as we talk about the changes in higher education, uh, find ourselves in many of the center um, as we uh, ensure our commitment to access for all um, local um, community members to transfer uh, pathways to partners such as ASU. Um, Chandler Gilbert, we are very proud that we are one of the top feeders. So we're the top feeder for engineering to ASU. Uh, we're one of the top feeders for business, and we continue to expand and um, grow other opportunities to transfer with ASU, specifically with our Polytechnic campus here in the Southeast Valley. So I really want to thank Dwayne Roan and Jonathan Schmidt for, his, uh, for their collaboration in that work as well. Um, we also, of course, are focused on our mission for workforce development also, um, and so you'll see us continue to grow on this campus and then our Williams campus in aviation, advanced manufacturing, healthcare, financial business services, which all incidentally also have opportunities for growth with ASU. So there's a lot of opportunity as we look at the future state of higher education. We're very pleased to be able to um, further these conversations and that you would join us in them this morning. So again, welcome, welcome. We're going to start this morning. If I can ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you would please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. It is now my pleasure to introduce President Crow. Michael M. Crow is an academic leader and educator, knowledge enterprise architect, and science and technology scholar. He is the 16th president of Arizona State University and has guided its transformation as a 21st century model for public metropolitan research universities, combining the highest levels of excellence, inclusivity, and social impact. Under his direction, ASU pursues teaching, research, and creative excellence focused on the major challenges of our time, 
as well as so central to the quality of life, sustainable development, and economic competitiveness of Arizona and the nation. Arizona was recently named the number one, I was gonna say again, number one in innovation among US universities for the fifth time, uh, consecutive year by US News and World Report, which is no surprise. Please give us a round of applause uh, to welcome President Cook. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Greg, Greg, and good morning, everybody. Is that too loud or is that okay? Okay, so what I want to do, do today is three things. First, um, make sure I stay on time. Second, uh, actually, that, we won't count that one. First, I want to just give you a very quick update on ASU, uh, what we're doing, and put that into context and use it as a, uh, basically, a, a way to project for you that it is only by redesign Redesign of the universities, redesign of K-12, redesign of the community colleges, redesign of how the cities work, redesign of how the state works. It's only through redesign that we can hope to achieve all of the greatness that Arizona has had in its foundation and potential. Uh, I've lived all over the country. I've been to all 50 states. I've been to more than 50 countries. I moved 21 times before I graduated from high school. I worked at 17 schools before I graduated from high school. I still haven't even counted because uh, we kept moving a lot here and there. I went to four high schools in three states in the 10th grade alone, uh, Maryland, Illinois, and Missouri, so I've been close to each other. And so the reason I say this to you is that this is a fantastic place. Arizona is a fantastic place. Coming on late, not drawing from any single dominant uh, cultural paradigm, uh, uh, being able to bring in people from everywhere, blend everybody together, uh, immigrants from everywhere, immigrants from the U.S., immigrants from all over the world, everybody coming here to this kind of new place, building it from scratch out here in the desert, making it work, being technologically advanced, being more open to new ideas than any place that I've ever been, being focused on really children. I mean, a lot of our, our, our school performance is considered poor. It's considered poor because we're unbelievable critics, because we want it to be so much better, for instance. And so there's many things that we're doing, many things that we're doing right, many things that we're doing fantastically. This is a fantastic place. In fact, I would say that this place has as much or more potential than any other, what, what are called, the states are called the laboratories of democracy, any of the other laboratories. Laboratories of democracy mean we determine our own future. We determine what life is gonna be like in Arizona. We determine what's important. We determine what we focus on. We determine how we're gonna design the place and build the place. Are we gonna be sustainable? Are we, are we not gonna be sustainable? Are we gonna work on, on being equitable and fair? Are we gonna actually define justice in a way where it can be you know, really uh, uh, advanced in the way that it was idealized in the Constitution. All those things, I think, are possible here. So then uh, I came with my wife and my family 17 years ago from New York City, where I was a deputy provost and a senior faculty member at a place called Columbia University on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I'd been there for 12 years, doing technology deals and spinning out technology and developing new science things and making new kinds of companies go and, you know, teaching and, and doing all that kind of stuff and having loads of fun but in too small of an arena, in too rigid of a place. The future of the United States is not going to emerge at the level of success that we desire from the establishment institutions in the rest of the country. It's going to emerge from new places able to do new things. And so the, the opportunity here and the reason that I was hired was to basically take this very large public university which had not yet matured and see if you could actually build a new kind of university. And I'm using this as an example. Could you build a high speed, technologically enabled, entrepreneurially oriented, highly adaptive university that could scale to a fast moving community and embrace all of its talent and empower that community to move in new directions? So here's where we are. 17 years into the process, sorry to tell you that academia is a hard fought process. You know, it's a five yards at a time for 17 years and so I, I, I like to think that I can carry the ball I, with the best of them, and so, and you get tackled a lot, and you get tackled behind the line a lot, but we've made a lot of progress. Here's some of that progress. ASU today is one of the 10 most significant patenters of all universities on the planet. We weren't even in the top several hundred when we started that process. We produced 8,000 graduates per year that were not representative of the socioeconomic diversity of Arizona in 2003. This year we produced 27,000 graduates who are representative of the socioeconomic diversity of Arizona. 
and are over-representative of the ethnic di diversity. Never been done before. We took our research funding level from 100 million a year to approaching $700 million a year, which is more funding outside of medicine than Stanford or UCLA, more than Columbia, Princeton, Harvard, uh, more than Carnegie Mellon, more than Caltech. You've heard these things before, but that isn't where we were, but that's where we are now. We lowered the cost to the state to produce a degree, their investment in us, by 75%. We kept ourselves in the bottom quarter, the bottom quartile of students with debt. Ha uh, almost half our students graduate with no debt, and those that graduate with debt, it's in the bottom quarter. We try to keep the student's debt level to the price of a, of a nice radio Honda Civic. That's a fantastic investment. We rose, we increased our return on investment. So if you go to ASU and you make the, the investment in ASU and you attend ASU, your return will be on average 14% per year on your investment over your entire life. We've gone from attracting a couple thousand employers to visit the university per year to hire people to 13,000 organizations come to ASU from all over the world to recruit our students. We've grown the largest engineering school in the country. In 2009, we had 8,000, actually 7,000 on-campus engineering students. We had a low freshman retention rate, only 68% because it was a weed out culture. Show up, we'll let you in, and then if you can't hack it, too bad you're in the dustbin. Bad. So we went from 7,000 on-campus engineering students to 17,000 on-campus engineering students, increasing the number of minority engineering students by thousands, increasing the number of women uh, engineering students by thousands. And then once we figured out how to do that, we also then plugged the technology coupler, including using some technologies that come from and partnerships that we have with companies here in Chandler. We coupled this technology platform to our engineering school and then obviously to the rest of the university, but our freshman retention rate went from 68% to 90%. And then once we did that, we said, you know what, I bet that this technology coupler will allow us to teach world-class engineering to an electrician's mate serving forward deployed on an aircraft carrier. Sure enough, we have the first fully accredited online electrical engineering degree for undergraduates in the world. We have Star Trek level, Vulcan science camp level <laughs> courses. We have 51,000 online degree seeking students at ASU. 16,000 of them are STEM majors. Unbelievable, no lie, Vulcan science camp. 75,000 students on campus from 140 countries. ASU is the number one destination for international students at a public university in the United States. I'm not going to walk you through all these things other than, oh, we did double the four-year graduation rate also. Our graduation rate now is equal to the graduation rate. Graduation rate's a tricky thing. If you're UC Berkeley and you only admit students with A-plus averages from high school, guess what? They have a high graduation rate. I hope so. So our graduation rate now is at or above the level of all the great research universities in the U.S., that still perform their public mission and admit students qualified, which is a B average to get into college. So this year we had 14,000 first year students. That used to be called freshmen, getting a lot of flack for that. So now we're calling them first years. I can't get it out of my head, I still think freshmen. But first years, 14,000 first year. All 50 states everywhere, 8,000, almost 9,000 from Arizona, the largest freshman class we've ever had, 2,000 more freshmen from Arizona this year versus two years ago. Unbelievable demand for what we've got going on. Of those incoming first year students, half come in with A averages from high school, half come in with B averages from high school. Our four year graduation rate for an incoming A level student is now just under 75%. The UC system's four-year graduation rate is 62%. Our students coming with B averages were approaching 50%, which is three, over three times the national average, which is only 15%. So we have altered the university in every possible way. 
relative to a small company here in Chandler called Intel, which is a global manufacturing center. We're the number one source of college graduates to that company on a global basis. We have a staff of 25 people in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam working as a part of the complex human capital supply chain that helps Intel to be the successful corporation that they are, and I'm just picking them as an example. We run the National Engineering Alliance program in Vietnam, working with all six major universities and all of the polytechnics in Vietnam because that's a part of making things here successful. I won't walk you through all the things that we're doing, but I will say we have 160 investor-backed spin-out companies, several of which are based here in Chandler, heavily in the materials space, heavily in the uh, renewable energy space, algae technology company based here in Chandler and a bunch of other stuff that's going on. And then on top of that, with the scale of our research enterprise, again, built from scratch, built in this highly entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially receptive place, Arizona, we've been able to build this high-speed, highly adaptive university. Oh, by the way, we have 700,000 learners hooked into our learning platform that we built to help our students on campus. And it turns out you can connect to us and there's no sweat off our back. It just helps people to get a course here, to get a little thing here, to take a little math class here. We built a math thing, trying to tackle the math bugaboo, and community colleges face this just as we do. So the kid has an A in math from high school. They don't know it. They don't really understand it. They haven't mastered it. They mastered taking the test. They haven't mastered the subject. So we built a math class that will then teach you with a robot tutor individually tutoring you through every single thing you don't understand using every technique imaginable for you to gain an understanding of that math. That took our, our college algebra mastery level from 50% to 90%. Changing our retention rate, which is now a hair under 90% for our students from Arizona. That is, used to be in the 50s that would make it through the freshman year at ASU. Now it's a hair under 90 now, these are all examples of us trying to do a, a really, really important thing, us trying to build an ultra-modern, state-of-the-art, globally impactful, powerful university for this community. Because all the communities that are the most successful economically now, and all of the communities that are the most successful even more going forward, have one of those or two of those, or three of those. Even in places like Singapore, from scratch, from nothing, they've built two world-class universities after living in the rubble at the end of World War II, eating dogs and, and, and starving in the streets. And they've built world-class universities from scratch in Singapore, from scratch. Now here, this place, this county, is as big as Singapore, population-wise. This county is bigger than many, many, many countries, Ireland, other places. So we have to build a university, a public university, which is, as the introduction suggested, focused on what we call egalitarian access, the true model of a public university. Are you qualified? And if you're qualified, we have room for you. If you don't have money, we'll find money for you, or a job for you, or a way for you to get through the university. So we've built that. But if you build that and you don't build academic excellence at the highest possible level, you won't have a great university. Now, I'm saying all of this because the talk I'm going to walk you through, and I'm going to do a take a slightly different approach with this talk. We have big issues in Arizona, huge issues, huge, huge, huge issues. We grow, and we think that's economic growth. We attract people here and we're like, that's good. We build houses and apartments like there's no tomorrow, which is fine. That's not a sustainable economy. And so the thing that we've been working on for the 17 years that I've been in this job, the thing that we've been working on with our 4,600 faculty members and our 25,000 support staff operating on a global basis with fantastic, unbelievable opportunity for the people here from Arizona, what we're working on is to build our little piece of the equation, which is a world-class, scaled, research-grade university able to work with the community colleges, able to work with K-12, able to take advantage of everything. We built a digital high school. 
We got 15,000 students in our digital high school. What, why do we have a digital high school? Because some people need help. Some people want other pathways. Some people want tools. And so just I'm just basically trying to give you all this before I give you this talk because you're going to say, well, this is just academic mumbo jumbo. This pinhead that they brought in here from Columbia University. That, I mean, I've had people tell me since I moved here, believe me, where do they find people like you? Like, why are you here? We don't need you. This is a happy place. This is a happy place. You're a troublemaker. You are a troublemaker. Not, not everybody shouldn't be able to go to the university. Everybody doesn't go to the university. We need to get up to the national average of people graduating from the university. Here's a factoid that ought to get your attention. I think we're in the top five or ten of all, I think top five of all places in the country, all metroplexes in the country that attracts college graduates above the age of 40. Who cares? Who cares? Most of them are above the age of 60, like me. We're not in the top 30 in attracting people under the age of 30 with a college degree to this community. That by itself, that one factoid alone should be great cause for concern. So what I'm going to do with this talk, and I apologize, and you can go home and tell your partner or your spouse, I heard this weirdo today come in and try to give us some kind of academic mumbo jumbo lecture. But, but I'm going to try to walk you through something that I have not been successful yet in the various forms of this talk that I've given, finding anybody who says, you know what, that's probably worth taking a closer look at. What they say is that can't be true. So I want to talk about not just education, but I'm going to talk about what it means to actually build a stronger economic future. So here's an important thing. One of the biggest myths is that the, in order to foster economic development, a community must accept growth. The truth is that growth must be distinguished from development. They're not the same thing. Growth means to get bigger. Development means to get better. Enhancements in quality of life, enhancements in outcomes, enhancements, fewer people on welfare, fewer people going to jail, fewer people dropping out of high school so that then they can go to jail since 70% of the people in jail are high school dropouts, like one of my brothers. He's been in jail and is a high school dropout. So. I'm going to try to get one idea. I got a lot of slides here. We're going to send them to you. Angela, we'll make sure we get these sent to everybody. I'm going to try to get one idea into your heads. And it's this idea of three types of economies. Fragile economies, but first let's look at the word fragile. Fragile, the quality of being easily broken or damaged. Fragile, easily broken or damaged. It's, it's touchy. Got to be careful. Wave comes along, sandcastle's gone, fragile. Economic crisis comes along, whew. We had the most serious whew, this in the last recession of any part of the country, and we had the slowest recovery. But people are really happy that people are moving here. Like, okay, that's not enough. Resilient. Capacity to absorb disturbance, reorganize while undergoing change. Still ret retain the same function, structure, and identity. Same place, but you're resilient. You're back and forth. If you get knocked down, you get back up. I was a, a heavyweight wrestler in high school, and I wrestled uh, my last year in metropolitan Chicago, and uh, there was no upper weight limit. And so I weighed about 15 pounds uh, less than I do now. So I weighed about 220 then, 235 now. And so I would wrestle these guys that weighed 100 pounds more than me. If I got knocked down, I mean, death was coming. <laughs> if I got off my legs, and so this ability to absorb, I was a resilient wrestler. I was not a fragile wrestler. So I ain't going to let anybody hurt me. But I was resilient. Now, what I wasn't was, uh, what I wasn't, though, because I wasn't a good enough athlete, was I wasn't anti-fragile. Something that thrives and grows when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, and stressors and loves adventure, risks, and uncertainty. Now, I have some characteristics like that in my own life, but not as an athlete. You've got to be a fantastic athlete to be able to do that. Anti-fragile. So, 
Here is per capita GDP. What is per capita GDP? It's a really simple calculation. People in Arizona like to delude themselves that this thing doesn't make any difference. It does. These are three economies at the metropolitan level. Anti-fragile, per capita real GDP. Resilient and fragile since 2001. Well, those are the cities, the metropolitan areas. Now you can say, and by the way, there's nothing about me that's doom and gloom. There's not an ounce of my body and not an ounce of my brain that has anything or any uh, uh, countenance to anything negative. It's not negative. I'm just reporting on the facts. You go to the weigh-in, if you don't weigh 185 or less and you're trying to wrestle 185, if you weigh 185 and one ounce, you ain't wrestling. So you go spit some more, then you come back and then you can wrestle. It's just a fact. This is the fact. It's like football. No matter what you say, the only thing that measures whether or not you are successful in the actual game itself is, did you win or did you lose? I don't want to hear your sorry little excuses, uh, blah, blah, Joey had a cold or whatever. If Joey had a cold and you didn't have another Joey, well, you lost. And so anti-fragile. Now, you tell me, and I get all kinds of uh, thoughts about this, lots of them from bigots. You know, it's just the funniest thing to listen to a bigot that doesn't know they're a bigot. And so, uh, and so, and so they'll say, well, the reason that, AS, that, that Phoenix is yellow is, we're all the Mexicans. Yeah, but people say this. Or all the Native Americans, or all the people on welfare, or all the people on this, or all the people on that. I'm like, what are you talking about? These are all complicated places and complicated cities. In fact, many of them are more complicated than this place by a long shot. And so you tell me what, what goes on in Seattle that doesn't go on here. Just somebody, let's just hear it. Anybody been to Seattle? Rain, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's useful. It seems to make a real difference there. So Jared Diamond, the UCLA geographer who wrote Guns, Butter, and a bunch of other fabulous books, he says that uh, uh, if you want to really have a struggle developing economic opportunity, live in a place where the sun shines the most. He says you reduce your will to adapt. You become lazy. You become focused on things. He, he, he's talking about all over the world. He's looked at all these economies all over the world and in different countries. And he says where the sun shines the most is the most difficulty of advancing the economy. Now, he wasn't talking about Phoenix per se, but just ask yourselves. So rain, okay, that's good. What else about Seattle? Technology, but companies that are homegrown, Boeing, Microsoft, Amazon, Starbucks, Costco, REI, Microsoft, you know, you, you, you know the groups. Why do those grow there? So, so Pittsburgh, you know, we, we were doing pretty well here. And then Pittsburgh, resilient, Carnegie Mellon University, Robot City, Robot Central, this, 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 all the things that they've got going on. And then look at that number for us. So it turns out that real per capita GDP, there's two places with, with uh, that are fragile, Bismarck and uh, Phoenix, but Bismarck has had Bismarck, North Dakota, not not some other place, small town, huge influx of energy resources, but still fragile. Second, those energy resources are gone. Forget it. So this is a busy chart. Don't want you to really spend a lot of time reading on it. We'll send it to you. But we went through and looked at in fragile metro metros, resilient metros, and anti-fragile metros. How do they think about things like economic development? So. Political attitudes in fragile metros. And I'm not talking about Phoenix. If, if this hits you and pings you, okay. We looked at all of them. All of the metropolitan areas, all of their policies, all of their frameworks, and those that were fragile, those that couldn't make adjustments, had the following characteristic. They ignore or avoid risks. They embrace stability. They conserve resources. Everything is about conservation. Everything is about not spending, not doing this, not taking any risks, not building any infrastructure, working against the notion of what they might do, keeping the teacher's salaries as low as possible. Economic policy. 
tax policy is considered in fragile metropolitan economic zones the singular most important policy tool. It isn't. It's important. It's not the most important. And then in anti-fragile, and this is the case, this is not made up, not even considered important. It's just another thing. You, I'm seeing some head shaking here about some of these things. And so it turns out labor force in fragile metros, substitutable commodified labor. I have been to meetings in the last six months telling me that I and ASU, we are the reason that you can't get construction workers to work at projects in Arizona. No joke. And that same group of people have worked to undermine the university because they believe that we are a threat to that. So I'm going to this chart basically just says educational attainment is lower in Arizona. We're the gold one there. We're, we're educational attainment means if you if you if you believe that there's a correlation and I've talked to people, even elected officials from Chandler, uh, I've talked to elected officials from this part of Arizona who tell me there's no correlation between educational attainment and economic competitiveness. And I say, well, here's a wheelbarrow of economic evidence. You know what they told me? Oh, you made it up. I made it up. Wow. Made it up. So it turns out that we're doing fantastically well for the past economy and not well for the future economy because we do not have a workforce which is adaptable enough. And it's not about only getting a college degree. It's about finishing high school. It's about getting the associate's degree. It's about getting the bachelor's degree. It's about going, being able to go back and get the bachelor's degree after you have the associate's degree 10 years later. It's about finding a great technical school. It's about graduating, about graduating from college. There are 1.1 million people in Arizona that went to college and didn't finish. And we've polled them. 900,000 of them wish they could have finished. There's nowhere for them to finish very easily. We're building programs, online programs, other things for them to finish. So 33% is the college attainment rate that the most competitive, that's the average. We're below the average of the U.S. workforce, and our rate of growth against that is diminishing. We're underproducing. There's the gap. Now, these numbers not, may not seem very, very high to you. So we have a gap 4.2%. It will grow to 6.4%. Well, let me just tell you, whatever you think of as the economy, I, w I graduated from high school in 1973. That was like the dark ages, you know, drive, driving a gremlin. Dark ages, carburetors. <laughs> Engines my brothers and I could take out of the cars and rebuild and put them back in. I can't even, I don't even know what my engine is now in my car. So here's an interesting chart. Bachelor's degree attainment, and now, uh, let me be clear. Bachelor's degree in this context is, is just an attainment proxy. If you have a bachelor's degree, you are more likely to be able to be more adaptable to a fast-changing economy than if you don't. If you have a high school diploma, only, there's 25% fewer jobs in the American economy than there were in 2007. I don't care what anecdotal evidence you have about how things are going in this little pocket of some part of some sector somewhere, there are 25% fewer jobs. If you are a white female with a high school diploma or less in the United States, you have a declining lifespan. First time that's occurred for any group or subgroup in the history of the country. These things are really important. So degrees are not just proxies for who can be the most flexible in the workforce. They're proxies for other kinds of things. And what this basically says to you is the following. This line plotting a chart, this is every state. The size of the circle is the size of the state. This is the per capita GDP. There's Arizona, well off, well off. In fact, almost an oddball. Look at Texas, 
Look at Colorado, look at Washington, look at Oregon, look at Utah. I don't even, I don't even put up states that people hate to talk about. I just pick states that people think are kind of okay. In this case, except for, well, so look at Colorado. So you tell me why Colorado has a per capita GDP where it is. Why? So pound for pound, person for person, what's somebody say, like marijuana or something like that? <laughs> yeah, not hardly. That's 0.5% of the Colorado economy. Person for person, the people in Colorado are running an economy 25% larger than the Arizona economy. Why? I would say to you, there's a correlation between the capability of the workforce to adapt to the changing economy. This is educational attainment going this way. I literally had this guy, an elected official, say to me, he didn't believe any of this. This was all made up. I'm like, it's hard to make up division because it works this way. So, so you look at how many people have a college degree, which you get from the census data, and then you take the entire economy of the state and you just divide it by the number of people that live in the state. That's your per capita GDP. And then you just plot the two things against each other. That's the plot. This is not believed in Arizona. I do not know why. It is not believed. Well, obviously, if you look at consensus decisions, it's definitively not believed. I mean, there may be lots of individuals, I believe, that there are. But consensus decisions, which are the result of policy actions, and I'm, talking, I'm not talking about just spending. I'm not talking about spending or teacher salaries. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm just talking about the fact, you know, we're not attracting college graduates under the age of 30. Why is that? Well, we actually surveyed all of them, and we know why it is. It's not true what the outsiders believe, but it's what they say. It's not a welcoming place. That's what they say. So this is a funny chart. You ought to pay close attention to this. This is every job in Arizona, every person working in Arizona, classified by job type, defined by educational requirement for the job. So this is the entire Arizona workforce, millions of people. This is all of the retail salespersons, all the cashiers, all the personal care aides, all the telemarketers, cooks in fast food restaurants, dining room attendants, dishwashers, electricians, uh, carpenters, executive assistants, uh, the words get smaller here, uh, drivers, child care workers, uh, educational teachers like uh, 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 community college teachers, preschool teachers. This is every job. Every single job. You can see it by educational attainment and by the nature of the job. Now, what we did is we used other people's data and we went through and said, which jobs have the highest probability of being replaced by automation? The redder the color, the higher the probability of the job being replaced by automation. That doesn't mean everyone gets wiped out. It just means that lots of people get wiped out. Now, what does this tell you? By the way, this is the, we did all 50 states. This is one of the five reddest states, not for the reasons that you think. No formal education is a huge thing here because of the service industries that are here. Now, this tells me, back to that famous movie, The Music Man, we got trouble right here in River City. And the trouble is that we're not thinking about this. We're not preparing for this. Now, again, people get all bollocked up, maybe even some of you. Oh, it's, uh, you guys are just egghead professors. You just want to, you just think everybody needs a college degree. I don't think that. I do think that people need to attain a high school diploma or the equivalent of a high school diploma at the earliest age possible. I do believe that they need after that to have opportunity to go to technical school, military training, uh, community college, university, and then like nothing else we've ever seen before, they need access to all of those throughout the rest of their life because nothing is going to be the same. So right over here, anybody here from Intel? Yeah, so how many, how many, how many transistors are on your latest chips? So the transistor was built, invented, never existed before in 1947, 72 years ago. Billions, 7.2 7 billion. 
transistors on one chip, and that is a tinker toy compared to where we're going. It's going to change everything. 5G, 6G, 8G, 10G, change everything. I was telling some folks earlier, we just had three faculty members stolen away by Google, paying them million dollar signing bonus. Not football coaches. <laughs> Engineering faculty members to do unbelievable stuff related to the whole new economy as it's, ro as it's rolling out. So everything's gonna change. So here's Arizona's investment in post-secondary education per $1,000 of personal income, right there. Okay, whatever. I'm not suggesting that it needs to be far to the left. I am suggesting that it needs rational thought. Rational thought goes something like this right now. No. Please. No. Pretty please. Go away. So this is the decline in higher education spending within Arizona. Now again, does this discourage me? Nah, not really. This tells me there's no planners here. There's nobody thinking through what the economy needs to be because they believe that the economy solves itself, which it does, assuming you have an educated workforce. Then the economy solves itself. So I am a loyal, blue blood capitalist. I believe in the work of, of Schumpeter and the notion and the forces of creative destruction and that everything that's inefficient should be replaced by that which is efficient, and everything that's not the best should be replaced by something that's better. Innovate, 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 drive the economy forward, make no mistake about it. To do that in the 19th century is not like that in the 21st century. We decided a long time ago, what was something that we decided that altered everything? That was a project that we decided, absolutely. And before that, we decided that everybody needed to read why, why did we decide that everybody needed to read? And now we've decided that everybody doesn't need to know this or everybody doesn't need to know that. Everybody doesn't need to go to high school, that we can pretend that it's 1940. It's not 1940. So that's a return on a, on a degree. What we're after is learn to learn. It turns out that people who learn to learn continue to earn more over their lifetime. Here's the funny thing. So it is economically rational to go to work the day you graduate from high school. It's economically rational to drop out of high school and go to work and get a twenty-two dollars to $32,000 a year job. You just have to make certain that you understand that that will be your salary 40 years later and that you'll be not capable of getting another job in most cases. Some cases, a lot of geniuses out there, they can do anything. Those are the exceptions. So we produce a lot of graduates. They do a lot of things. I'm not going to walk. We're going to send this to you. We have decided to change our research activity dramatically. These are the schools we're now be beating in terms of research. So if you see some logo of some cheesy little loser school on here, that's a, that's a <laughs> including my, my old school right here. So what this, the way this chart works, there are 876 universities or colleges in the United States that have funded research that, don't, that, that also have uh, uh, medical schools. But if you factor out their medical schools, which we don't have, we don't do this chart, they do. This is who you beat, blah, 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 ching blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I just read somewhere in some paper yesterday that we have the most significant football rivalry in the known universe, uh, measured against all others. I'm like, yes, I'm familiar with that. And so I'm not going to walk you through all of these, but I am going to say that these are all schools that you wouldn't imagine we we're beating on a regular basis in all of these topics. So what I'm trying to tell you here, uh, this is an interesting one here, National Science Foundation, 579 colleges and universities in the U.S. got some kind of funding from the most elite science agency on the planet. We beat all of those. In most places, our faculty would be considered valuable to the success of the community. Not so here, not so here, and not enough even from Chandler, DOD funding. I don't know where people think our military gets its thing. It's 
We have a $17 million project funded by an agency called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA, building a chip that can't be bought from anywhere on the planet to perform a particular function that the military would like to see performed, which is the lowest possible power, long-lasting chip that can also do calculations and communications in the same chip. Okay, ASU won that. We have thought-controlled drones that fly around a room about this size off of nothing but what the person is thinking. Where to go, how to swarm, how to fly, how to move. And so it turns out we've got all this going on. We're producing all these companies, all these spin-out companies. I'm just going to walk you through this. We've got all these things going on, blah, 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 blah. Innovation parks, the things we've got going on with you here in Chandler. We've got uh, the School of Engineering, as I mentioned, that we've grown and expanded. We now have six engineering schools. We're going to be adding a seventh engineering school, 25 undergraduate degrees, six interdisciplinary programs. We feel like we are out somewhere about 80 miles from the South Pole in Antarctica alone. What I mean by alone is without the support of the community. And I'm not talking about you all. I'm just saying what it's like. So we're out ahead of the game here. So we're trying to build a university for what the economy needs to be, but nobody here thinks that that's what the economy needs to be. So we get really massively excited when somebody decides that they're going to build another data center. I'm like, okay, well, that's good. We need data centers, and we need a lot of them. But if that's all we end up with, then we're not going to see any actual economic development here. For economic development in the way that we're talking about it, it's, talk about, it's about research, it's about discovery, it's about creativity, it's about the launching of things that have never existed before. We've been trying this. We've been trying to make this happen. This is what we've done in engineering, numbers of undergraduates, numbers of students, how we've changed. That's a 10-year change in numbers of undergraduates in engineering. Now, by the way, we're producing them. We need to do everything we can to keep as many of them here as we possibly can. We've got a lot going on with Intel, like I mentioned, a lot going on in the Chandler Innovation Center, and thank you for that. Our Polytechnic campus is off and running and doing fantastically well. Our ASU West campus is growing. Our Health Solutions Center with Mayo in North Phoenix, so we have $100 million being building being built there. Mayo's decided to put in another, another billion dollars of, inf of infrastructure just on that site. The research park is almost full, lots of things going on there. We have this Novus uh, Innovation Corridor project here. This, that's uh, Wells Fargo, or what was Wells Fargo Arena until yesterday. Uh, we have a, a new sponsor. Uh, and, so, and so this is what we're building right now in Tempe. Uh, we just attracted a, uh, uh, an Indian software technology development company to that site. That then will connect to other companies and other kinds of activities around here. This is one part of our project, Marina Heights. This is the renovation of Sun Devil Stadium. This is the Sky Song project. I'm, I'm trying to give you a sense of the fact that we're not just empty words at ASU. We leapt off the cliff, held our nose. I remember from my Naval ROTC training, they put us up on a 10-meter platform with our rifle and our helmet and our life jacket, and they said, well, now jump into the water. I'm like, well, that's insane. <laughs> so you cross your legs, you put your hands there, put your head down so your helmet doesn't rip off the top of your head, and then into the water you go. So we've gone into the water of building the university for the future economy in every possible way. That's the point. You know, we've already taken that step. We think that's a necessary, important first step. What I want to pose to you all, to the notion of education, why aren't we graduating everybody from high school? So we got sick of that, so we decided to open up charter schools, and fill them up with any kid that comes, 85% Title I. We have a 100% graduation rate. Not because we're smarty, smart, that's not what we're doing. It's because we set out as the goal that everyone would graduate. We set out as the goal that everyone would go on to a post-secondary thing. They'd go to community college, they'd go to technical school, they'd go to the university after high school, they'd go into the military and then come back. And if they didn't, we were going to fire you. Accountability is 100% graduation rate. The first year we had a graduating class, we were at 98%. And I said, well, that, that you can probably think pretty good of yourself. The goal is 100%. And by the way, these kids are now achieving entry. We have kids coming from 
communities that weren't achieving entry to the Barrett Honors College that now are achieving entry to the Barrett Honors College. Coming to Chandler Gilbert, doing really well, and then coming to the Barrett Honors College, and then majoring in engineering. Coming out of the polytechnic school that we have, the charter school that we have called ASU Prep Polytechnic, which is a STEM school, and making that work. 50% of the kids are white, 50% of the kids are not white. So it doesn't make any difference. This whole thing about, well, these kids from these poor families or minority families or whatever, that's why they're not graduating. No, the reason they're not graduating is that the business community and the chambers and everybody else are not holding everyone accountable and saying, you are accountable, you people that are running these schools. And so that's why we did that. We're doing more innovation centers. Digital Innovation Corridor in downtown Mesa, we're building a $75 million uh, headquarters with help from the city of Mesa, investment from the city of Mesa. We've traveled all over the world to find the most elaborate, most significant places in Singapore, Sydney, Hong Kong, London, Brooklyn, where they're working on digital everything and trying to make that happen. This is what that thing will look like. A creative futures laboratory for Mesa. And so again, the point here and the, really the message I want to get across to you is that we have a fragile economy. ASU has contributed to that fragile economy by not being what we now are. We're trying to empower us moving at least to a resilient economy, but where we really want to get to is an anti-fragile economy. We're feeling kind of alone out there, kind of ahead of everybody. And I was hoping that you guys would sign up. So that's my talk. Any comments, any questions? And we'll, we'll get you this so you can take a look at it. So. Is this on? Perfect. Um, we are taking some questions, so if anybody wants to come up and we can hear from you. I know your brains are on overload right now. <laughs> Except that they're recording, but other than that. Okay, so. then I will. I listened to that, and I have to say that as a grandmother, I've got one grandchild that I do want to go to the school that has a lot of red, but that's okay. They've got a great veterinary program. Mm -hmm. But I have three that I'm actually saying you need to do ASU, and here's why. And you didn't really mention it. What ASU is doing for the arts now, mm -hmm. you spent a lot of time talking about engineering yeah. and the technology piece, yeah. and that's fantastic. But as humans, if we don't begin to really connect with the humanity yeah. of the humanity, we'll still be lost. So I do want to acknowledge that I've really looked into your program and I have one grandson now who will be working through Herberger. Yeah, so Herberger, uh, thank you for that. So the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts is the largest fine arts college in the United States. Uh, and so, and so, um, <laughs> and, and under, under our dean and the staff there, Stephen Tepper and his staff there, it is literally in a positive sense on fire. Uh, new programs, uh, unbelievable enrollment. Uh, the MESA program is really their program. So that's going to be coming out of Herberger. We've got projects uh, uh, all over the valley, all over the state, all over the country, all over the world. Tremendous things. So let me give you one story about, about, uh, about Herberger. I was at, um, we had a meeting on campus and I went to Reform Jewish Services uh, last year, year before last, and a, a, a girl was cantor. She was singing, beautiful voice. She was a voice major. ASU, so I happened to sit next to her at the, at the dinner following the services, and um, I said, well, what's your story? Well, I'm from Chicago. I got into Juilliard, which is one of the top music schools in the country, uh, and uh, I didn't want to go to Juilliard because Juilliard didn't let me ma double major in biochemistry, and so, because they don't have biochemistry, because they just think you should study whatever you study there and nothing else, and we're like, here at ASU, you can study whatever you want. So she double majored in biochemistry and in opera, uh, we have a fantastic opera program, we have a fantastic music school, we have a thousand music students, we have fantastic performance programs, a fantastic conservatory built into ASU. Most people don't even understand this, but she's now in medical school and her goal is to become a research physician working on the maximization of the potential of the human voice uh, and understanding the human voice. And so that's, that's the kinds of things that we've, got, that we've got going on. And this is 
everywhere, just everywhere, all these things are happening. So thank you for those comments. The law school, which has moved to downtown Phoenix, the Sandra Day O'Connor uh, College of Law, is now ranked in the top 10 of all public university law schools and the top 25 of all law schools in the country. It's doing fantastic. We've shot through the rankings. We've shot through everything. We're very diverse, uh, uh, ethnically diverse. Uh, the school's doing quite well, high levels of employment, high levels of outcome, high levels of funding, high levels of research. We just got approved to give the third year of the law school for anyone that wants to spend that year in Washington, D.C., in our D.C. center. And so that's been approved by the ABA, so you can go two years in Phoenix and one year in Washington to get and, and so forth. So we're very excited about that. Our building in Washington is, is, is off to a great start. The building that we're renovating in Los Angeles, people say, why Los Angeles? Well, I don't know. Just read the economic report on uh, Los Angeles as uh, one of the top economies on the entire planet if it was a country. And so what we want to do is expand our film program, which is the most diverse in the country already ethnically, to uh, uh, Tempe, Mesa, and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, we want to expand our journalism school uh, into Los Angeles. We want more opportunities in Los Angeles. Most of our venture capital for our spin-out companies comes from California. Fine. We need to be there, so we joined the Los Angeles Venture Association, LAVA. Uh, we've got all kinds of things going on over there, projects, programs, research. Uh, a number of our space technologies, we have 16 off-Earth mis missions. Our company's based in Chandler, company's based in, in uh, the East Valley, and company's based in Metro Los Angeles. And so we're connecting ourselves to all these things in every possible way, trying to break down all of the barriers just to give you some sense of all that. So it's not just about science or technology. These things are all blended together, actually. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes. Good morning. Thank you for this presentation. That was absolutely amazing. My name is Jane Poston. I'm a small business owner and a Chandler Chamber board member. So you mentioned throughout your presentation a few times that you would like to see more support from the community. So could you maybe articulate a little bit more on what that means in terms of actionable items for us as business owners, chamber members, our elected officials, our schools here in Chandler to think about? So um, I'll give you an example. So a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago, I was invited by the Republican governor of Tennessee, Bill Lee, to be the keynote speaker at a meeting of uh, all the leaders of all the public universities in the state of Tennessee. So we have three public universities in Arizona. They have six public universities in Tennessee. One of them is a system, the University of Tennessee, which has multiple campuses. So they have University of Memphis, Chattanooga, Austin P, uh, Tennessee Tech, Middle Tennessee State, and the University of Tennessee. So they brought everybody together. And they decided not to have a single board like we have. They decided now to have separate boards for all the schools. And this was the training session for all the board members coming in from all over the state. And so this is going to be hard for me to express, but it shocked me to see that ASU produces more college graduates and does more research than all of the public universities in Tennessee combined. Because they have $1.7 billion in public investment for those six universities. We have $320 million of public investment producing more product. Now, I'm not arguing that we need $1.7 billion of public investment. I just need people to stop to start operating with thoughtful brains. We have said over and over and over and over that we will fund the university by our entrepreneurial energy. Please support the kids from Arizona. Please help the universities to be more successful more, more operationally successful with the kids from Arizona. So we, we've been unsuccessful at making this case. We've been unsuccessful at making the case. So Arizona has the 46th lowest college going rate in the country. In states like Georgia, who's been to Georgia recently? Yeah, over 10 million people now live in Georgia. In Georgia, if you graduate from high school with a B average or better, you don't pay tuition to go to a public university. Therefore, everybody knows I need to stay in high school, I need to work my tail off, I need to earn a B average, and then I'm going to have a way to go to college. Now, it doesn't say which college you're going to get into. We don't have anything like that, nothing. And I'm not suggesting that that's what we need. What I'm suggesting is that we need chambers, we need communities to step up and say, are we really investing our resources in the, in the right way? Are we really investing enough? Are we really investing with the right kinds of expectations? Are we really holding people accountable? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mostly what we hear about is, listen, you know, we just don't have any money. We're broke. Really? Doesn't seem that way. And so, and so what we have is, so here's an example. So, so how many of you are aware of AZ60? So we fought for years to produce a set of goals 
for educational attainment for Arizona. We took these goals from the, from the early adopters of these goals, Tennessee 55%, Colorado 66%, Utah 60%. The Utah case was driven by the Salt Lake City Chamber of Commerce, an unbelievable, all out, full throated, action oriented, knock the door down group. There was no reduction to public education during the entire recession in Utah. Here, eh. And so, and I'm not comparing A to B because it's apples to oranges, okay? What I'm saying here is in Utah, the business community stepped up and said, I want 90% high school graduation rate and I want 60% of everyone that graduates, I want 90% high school graduation rate by 18 and I want 60, and let's say the other 10%, or some combination of, you know, they've got family issues, mental health issues, physical health issues, and so we'll just sort of take that. Now we've eventually got to get those kids through also. So call that 100% high school graduation rate because they as businesses know that that's what they need for the benefit of their businesses, not just their employees, but for the growth of the economy. And then in Utah they said, and 60% post-secondary certificate. Associate's degree, technical certificate, or a bachelor's degree, 60%. So. In Arizona, some of us, including me, we worked hard to come up with an agreement which took us four years to get an agreement among various groups with resistance by many groups to have a goal. We don't need a goal. Nobody needs to be setting a goal. A kid knows that they should graduate and if they don't graduate, too bad for them. I'm like, okay, 16 year old brain's not exactly the thing I'd dress the future on. And so, and so we have a goal. So our AZ60 staff is fantastic, all one person. I've looked at the political agendas of all of the major chambers in Arizona. Education is not a top priority. <laughs> I said, I'm talking about all of them. <laughs> Chandler by itself isn't enough. I'm just telling you that, that it's just not. And so the setting of goals and working on these things, that's what, that's what we need. I have said to people that, you know, the business community should be beating down the doors of the universities, which is why I gave you an update saying we need this from you, we need this from you, we need this from you, we need you to do this. I'm going to pick on uh, Greg here. So Greg's got a tough assignment. So he's, he's running a very good, very successful community college, which isn't graduating at the rate that it should be, either are we. We're not performing at the level that, that we should be. And it's like, you know, everybody's like, okay, you know, whatever, whatever. So there, there are high schools in Arizona that have never graduated a single person from college. We have the 46th lowest college going rate and people are like, eh. And so it's, we are not yet understanding these things. That's, that's. And so it shouldn't be me talking about this stuff. It should be the business community talking about this stuff, beating us up. Why aren't you doing this? What about this? What about this? What about this? How come you haven't done this? We need more of this, more partners, more of this, more of this, more of this. So that's my answer to that question. Dr. Crow, thanks for being here. I'm Sheila Klepkorn. I'm a small business owner in Tempe mm -hmm. and really involved with clients here in Chandler. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also involved with a group called Singularity in uh, the Bay Area in California. Um, and there are a lot of folks involved in that group who believe that there will be a lot of different kinds of education in the future, not necessarily higher education given that not every university in the country is as innovative as ASU. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have different competition in the future given the accelerating rates of change mm -hmm. for technology. What do you think about those kinds of other educational uh, outposts that are happening? and that there's just gonna be a lot more opportunities in the future and, and for our community, um, I, I believe our ASU is really, really important, mm -hmm. um, but, but even the business community is gonna be approached with a lot of different options. Sure, and so, and so here's, here's what's going to happen. So never before in our own economic history and never before in even modern human history have we ever been faced with the speed of change that we're presently experiencing. And so we've come to the conclusion that there are three phases of learning. 
the first phase is largely the family's responsibility, and that is, and family is a broadly de defined thing, especially if you don't have one, uh, and so, and you're a kid, like, okay. And so, uh, and that is by the age of 48 months to prepare a person to be what we call a, uh, a prepared learner. To do that, they have to have the maximum vocabulary possible at age 48 months. That is the single most important predictor of, of educational attainment and, and learning adaptability, verbalization, because then you have concepts, et cetera. Then the second phase uh, is K through 12, what we think of as K through 12, and the objective there is to prepare a person ready to engage and ready to learn across a broad spectrum of a m for a modern economy, and we're not really doing that. So I've argued with people, people say, wh why do kids need to know algebra? Algebra is stupid, you don't use algebra in work. And I'm like, well, actually, I'm worried about you now because you're, 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 ta okay. you're, you're talking about things you don't know anything about. And so it turns out algebra is not about algebra. Algebra is al about figuring out how to solve for an unknown. And then the third phase of a, pr of a person's educational journey, uh, we've now trademarked the term universal learner, and we've, 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 we've taken community colleges and technical schools and singularities and all kinds of other kinds of places and the university, and we've blended them together into a Gordian knot. And what we say is that going forward, they're all going to be present, and people are going to move back and forth between all of these for the rest of their life including when they're 75 years old and don't want to do whatever they've been doing for all these years, and now they really want to sit, settle down and then make their creative contribution, take all their wisdom and do something. And so where are you going to find that educational opportunity at age 75, et cetera? And so, and so I'm, I'm a believer of uh, uh, every possible educational opportunity and then finding ways, organization, then finding ways for them to blend together, work together, and so forth. Now, our role in all of that is to take the knowledge creation research intensive environment that we've created and make that available for 17 and 18 year olds because that seems to be a sociologically important thing, but only a small percentage of kids can actually do that. Most actually can't. And so then you have to have other pathways and other routes and other ways of going and we need to break down all the barriers. So singularity, yes, other kinds of colleges, yes, more colleges, parochial colleges, technical schools, specialty schools, whole new ways of learning. We had a meeting the other day with the, um, the leader, the CEO of a part of, uh, of a sales force uh, called uh, Trailhead. Anybody know about Trailhead? Mm -hmm. How many students are in Trailhead? 1.5 million. Guess what they've come to see us for? They said that the kids that they're teaching to code and they're teaching artificial intelligence, they actually do not want to be just the next generation of factory workers who when as soon as they're replaced by an AI program will be booted to the curb. And so they say, I'd like to know what we're doing and why we're doing it, so could you also find a way to teach us philosophy? So where we're starting with them is can we teach the philosophy of artificial intelligence to people that are becoming coders of artificial intelligence because they're concerned that they're doing something that they don't know really know what they're doing. And so that's gonna be the way that we're going to work. So we, we now have more online philosophy majors than we have online, um, and then we have on-campus philosophy majors. Now, some of you are saying, why does anybody study philosophy? Don't ask me that. I'll, I'll, I'll think a lot less of you. Uh, and so, and so, and so this, this 1.5 million person learning environment now is coming back to us, saying how can we blend together? How can we work together? How can we move forward together? President Crow, I just have to do a shout out because I know that there's been a couple of issues at the state legislature in the last couple of years that um, have been us at the Chandler Chamber, it was a no-brainer to weigh in and support ASU on. And I know I took some heat from my surrounding chamber colleagues, um, still pulling the swords out, but um, you hand wrote me a note thanking me for supporting that. And in Chandler, we do value education. We use it as an economic development tool. And when you take a look, 72% um, of Chandler residents have some type of post-high school education. And we are at about 53% that have a bachelor's degree or higher. And we know that we're striving to have more. And that's why we do have those educational partners from our Ch local. Well, Ch well Chandler's actually at the above the level of the state of Colorado we in are. terms of the per capita GDP. But, but, and their voice is very, very important. Very important. Yeah. Dr. Crow, thank you so much for being here. My name is Lana Berry, and I'm with Chandler Unified School District. So we are 
we love our education system and we're always continuing striving to get better. One of the questions I had for you, I guess twofold, is how are you um, attracting your best and brightest educators to come to ASU, especially our homegrown a um, students here in Arizona? We're seeing the lack of um, students wanting to go into the Honors College related to teaching um, in some of those areas. So how are we attracting? Specific, specifically teaching or, or more broad? Well, teaching specifically um, at, at, for the K through 12 market and through higher education so that we're attracting our best and brightest all the way through. And then the second question I have for you is, what's your ideas and um, thoughts on how do we connect between K-12 and ASU and some of our um, educators on really um, making people want to come to Arizona for education K-12 and for higher ed? So, these are two complicated questions. So the, first, the first one, uh, we found that we were taking responsibility for nothing, our education policy for business of attracting the best and the brightest into teaching, uh, we're uh, offering teacher certificate pathways for students majoring in math, majoring in architecture, majoring in engineering that we weren't before, you are on, on a regular path that means you can still move your path, pathway forward. We have uh, grants to design and build new kinds of schools. So we have an idea of a thing that we call a community school. Now this causes all kinds of heart palpitations in the, in the K-12 community because we think that teachers should be paid three times what they're being paid now uh, in much more, more stable, stable environments. environments. Draw from expertise in the local community around them and then the teachers are the master teachers making high compensation salaries, fewer teachers, but more teaching going on, using technology, using other teachers and so forth, and that gets everybody all kind of nervous along the way. And then, and then um, to the second part of what you're talking about, uh, what we're trying to do is to find ways to partner with every school district, and it's the most difficult thing that we're doing right now. And so I'll give you a, a, a story. So I was sitting a few months ago at a lunch of senior administrators of different school districts. I think this was in Flagstaff, and I happened to be at a random table, e table eating my rubber chicken. And so, so the uh, one woman next to me, I, I said to these superintendents or assistant superintendents, what's your biggest problem? So this one woman said, well, we haven't had a math teacher in our school for 20 years. Wow. Well, it turns out we have a solution for that. We have robots that are unbelievably capable to augment a teacher who might not be math ready, to augment that teacher to be able to become a math uh, teacher of the highest possible caliber using these tools that we have. And we got no way to do those tools. You know, we got, and so the, the reaction was very, it was very uh, negative. The second person said to me, that her biggest problem was that she couldn't find um, substitute teachers who could speak English. This was down in southwest Arizona. And I said, well, you know, we can work on English also, meaning, meaning every time that we then say, well, we've got, we have a way to work with you, we have this, we have this tool, we have this, we have that, everyone becomes threatened, and I'm not suggesting you said this, but they become threatened that somehow we're going to affect the model and the teachers are somehow going to be replaced by whatever tool that we have. 
we have no, there's, there's not enough teachers. There's, there's too few teachers. We're interested in measuring everything against the success of the school. How do we get every school moving to this 100% graduation rate? How do we get these learning outcomes at the highest possible level? How do we make these things happen? And so our goal is to get everybody involved in this, people coming in from all the disciplines, teachers, people helping teachers, people working with teachers. It's not just the teacher. You know, we, 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 we somehow imagine, and you know, you're a teacher, uh, and so, and so they, we somehow imagine that it's just gonna be this hero walking into the front of the class who's now all of a sudden gonna wave some kind of magic wand and everything's gonna get better. And that's not gonna happen. It's not gonna work that way. It's, it's more complicated than that. And so we're looking to find ways to become basically integrated with the school district on every possible level, in every possible way. And that's proving to be difficult because we don't operate in a strict structured government bureaucracy kind of model that like a lot of schools do. We could spend some more time talking about it, but sort of a general answer. Oh, Hello. sorry, Gen Hello. Jennifer had her hand up also. Oh, that's okay, sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay, we need to do it. Okay. We have to cut this off. Yes, I'm going to Houston. <laughs> Try to get people over there to give me money for Arizona, so. <laughs> we raised $415 million this year in the year that ended uh, June 30th from 110,000 people. Uh, and 90% um, uh, of those gifts were under $100. And 90% of them came from people that weren't graduates of Arizona State University. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Crow. You know, I hope that you are successful at this because I love this community. I want it to thrive and be vibrant. I also thank Terry for all the hard work that she does and the chamber does. I dedicate my, my company to helping inform the community and the youth to safe driving. Mm -hmm. And as such, Every month, I get to sit down with between half a dozen and a dozen teens and talk to them about safe driving. No. And at the end, we ask them, what's the future? Where are you going? And it's an opportunity to talk to them about planning for the future. I'm stunned. Maybe only about 20% of them have college in the future mm -hmm. as their plan. It is interesting, the Chandler students seem to be prepared for it, but there are three impediments. Funding, I'm talking to 16 and 17 year olds, they have no idea where they're gonna get their money mm -hmm. for college. They have no idea how to go about getting a scholarship and they haven't really thought about what they wanna do at, at, at the next step. The next thing happens to be math they have no idea how to get through math and, and the math curriculum is a daunting idea for them. Yeah. And it's an impediment for them to think about a college degree. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, writing. Mm. M a lot of them are challenged by the English for filling out a um, essay to go about getting through that. But furthermore, the parents' involvement. Yeah. And so, I wanted to say if there's a way to show the slide about <laughs> where you go mm -hmm. without the, <laughs> the degree to every family in this state, I think that would be a powerful motivation. Okay. And so thank you very much. So just a quick comment on that. So we have a, a project or a program that you might wanna take a look at all philanthropy based. That is what it, we built a project called Me3. So me three, just go me three on the web and then sign up as an adult or as a parent. And it's a program that's supposed to be intended for high school students to answer 60 visual questions between two, uh, you know, two opposing pictures. You pick the picture that you're most attracted to. Don't overthink it, just pick the picture that you're most attracted to. And it does a learning and interest assessment of you in 60, in 60 pictures, 120 pictures. And so you do this and it does a pretty good job. It, it, it did a very good job with me when I took it. And then it says, okay, Michael, so it, sees, it seems that you're interested in this. These are the kinds of jobs that people with your interests uh, do. These are the educational pathways for you. These are the degree programs for you. This is the high school that you're at. This is the pathway that you're on, and then we connect it all in this game. So we've had 270,000 users of the game. We need a lot more users of the game and because then it finds the pathway. Now, the pathway is now also increasing the notion of then answering the financial questions. 
So it has a pathway to help the student to understand what their pathway might be, and then it has a pathway to answer the financial question. I can guarantee you any qualified student to come to Arizona State University who meets our admission requirements, either as an incoming first year or as a transfer student, if they don't have the means to pay, we have the means to pay. Now that is a huge financial stress on us, but we're still giving and living up to that promise. 80% of our students have financial aid. Uh, more than 16,000 of our undergraduates can pay nothing. We pay everything, 16,000. Uh, this year we'll invest $500 million in financial aid. I mean, I'm not talking about loans, I'm talking about grants. Our resources, $500 million. And so, so there, th there aren't financial barriers, but there's lack of awareness. And so we just won a grant, again, from outside of Arizona, from a guy named Eric Schmidt, who used to be the president of Google. And Eric's got so much money, you can't even count it. And I said, Eric, you need to use some of your money for some, like, some real stuff. And, so, and so, so he is a very smart person. He funded four universities, Wisconsin, uh, Ohio State, Utah, and us, uh, a million and a half dollars to come up with a series of ideas that could help people to change their family incomes within two years. So we won one of the projects, which was another million dollars, and the project for us was a way to get everybody to fill out the FAFSA, the federal financial aid form, because it turns out that many, many, many families with kids ready to go to college, they refuse to fill it out, they can't fill it out, they won't fill it out, uh, they can't, they, whatever, they have no information to fill it out, so we're working on that and solving that. So we're doing all of those things. And so the Me 3 program and the FAFSA program that we have are working on, on, on those things and working to move things forward. We also have now what we call chatbots. So chatbots are AI-based interactive systems that allow a student to ask hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of questions and tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people to ask these questions. And our chatbot, which is named Sunny, S-U-N-N-Y. So Sunny, Sunny is, is, is fantastic. So Sunny's now engaging with students, student prospects, students at the university helping to answer people's questions, helping them to, make, to move through. The point is, is that we're developing tools and devices and systems to help these kids to be able to see their career path see their pathway, find their financial aid solution, find a way to the university to make these things happen. Now our most difficult challenge is working with school districts. Well, we can't just talk to ASU, and even to some extent community colleges. And so because what's happened is that, is that, is that we're coming up with solutions that are out of the ordinary and it's like, well, how do they fit into how the place works or how it doesn't work and so forth? And so, so Greg, you, 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 you know the, some of the stuff that we've been working on and what we're trying to do. So, so those are some of the things that we're working on and, and lots of other things that we're working on within this space. I think there was one more question. Yeah, sorry. Hi, Dr. Crow. Jennifer Sanchez with Intel. Um, do you have a recommendation on what the public, like Arizona's public budget would be in public education and higher education? if we want to mirror like an anti-fragile Yeah, so I, have, I, have an, I have an approach versus a number. So the approach is not so much a number. The approach is line everybody up and say we're going to hold everybody accountable for enhancing the high school graduation rate, enhancing the college gr uh, graduation rate, enhancing productivity, enhancing the community college rate, and we're open for business to make investments to help you all to do that. And so, and so, and then you hold people accountable. It can't just be we need more money. It has to be we need more money and we will deliver more for that money. That's why I talked about Tennessee. $1.7 billion of public investment to produce fewer graduates than we produce. We have $320 million. So therefore, we already know we're really, really efficient. And so it's not a huge amount of money at the end of the day to make some of these kinds of changes. These are changes that can be made. What we need more than anything is the change to an innovation mindset. That's what we need. And then we need money to back up that innovation mindset, and then we need to see our productivity changes. Now, I'm overgeneralizing, so it's not a specific number. I will say that Arizona has now, we're at about the 75th percentile of per capita GDP. For decades and decades and decades, we were between the 90th and the 105th percentile. Now we're at the 75th percentile and going down. We also used to be at the 90th percentile of investment in higher education on a per thousand dollars of personal income. So, so thousand if you make ten thousand dollars, if you if you charge fifteen dollars for ten thousand dollars or fifteen dollars per thousand, if you have ten thousand dollars of income, 
then your contribution to higher education is $150. I mean, it's, that's how the system works. So that it was, so, so yes, so, but, but it was 50,000, I mean, it was $15 for decades and decades and decades and decades, and now it's $3. So that's a five-fold reduction. Now, out of that, you got really entrepreneurial universities and really creative things and this and this and this and this, but I'm telling you, that the investment level and the requirements and the expectations are too low. So we, we don't yet have, let's go back to AZ60, you ought to look at AZ60, look at those goals. How do we get to those goals? What does it take to get to those goals? And it's not just about money, but it's about organizational change, innovation, and investment, and accountability. So, okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you again, Dr. Crow, for uh, the reality check. I think we all just experienced. So, um, and safe travels and get more money. That's wonderful. Uh, we'd like to recognize again our presenting sponsor is Intel, copper sponsor Air Products and Chemicals, bronze sponsor Wells Fargo, turquoise sponsor ASU, Arizona State University. I have two graduates. Uh, my two kids graduated five years ago now, doing well. Um, our host sponsor, Chandler Gilbert Community College. Again, thank you for the space. And uh, everyone, let's, let's uh, make that difference. Let's commit to the community, commu commit to the future of Arizona, and have a great day. Thank you so much. <laughs>